And are you refreshed? Are you energized? Didn't you just love the challenge that Mark left us with? Let me hear you say, aha, uh -huh, if you loved the challenge that Mark left us with. Great, because what I'm about to give you is the means to achieve that challenge with effortless ease. What is the most resilient thing in the entire world? The one thing that can reshape the future and transform humanity once it's planted in a brain. An idea, right? But not just any idea. It's those ideas that are worth spreading. Those ideas that enliven the imagination. Those ideas that power us to soar above the limitations which are currently holding us back. It's those ideas that thrill us and make us go, aha. Aha moments are the accelerators of possibilities. They dissolve boundaries and they make us see things differently. Once a mind has been stretched by one aha moment, it can never go back to its original state. Aha moments are the steps on the staircase of progress. And it's because we know that. It's because we understand the power of aha that we're gathered in this room here today. It's because we crave their stimulating effect that we are here begging breakthroughs to penetrate our minds. Aha moments are the only virus which we are willingly wanting to be infected by. And so much so that we have become determined to turn ahas from a metaphysical experience into a precise science. About a year ago, I was called by an event planner, and that was because I was going to do a speaking engagement. And he called and he said, I'm really struggling with how to title your talk. And so I asked him, well, what's the struggle? Which is when he says, well, I read your research and I'd like to call it the science of breakthroughs. But I'm afraid that if I use the word science, nobody's going to show up because they'll think it's boring. So I was going to suggest, why don't we call it the art of aha moments? Which is when the insecure academic part of me went like, you're going to call it what? And he said, the art of aha. And I said, yeah, why not hocus pocus? But then I thought, you know, let me think about this for a moment. Because, you know, where I come from, which is the Republic of Moldova, Art, at the time when I was growing up, was the equivalent of witchcraft in the 15th century. If you drew anything other than the face of Lenin or an aircraft or a tractor, you'd get burned on a stick. They called this the socialist realism. But then I thought, you know, I'm trying to move forward. And when you're trying to move forward while you're holding on to the past, it's the same as taking poison and accept, expecting to feel good. And, you know, my talk is about breakthroughs, and breakthroughs do relate to both science and art. And so I said to him, why don't we call the talk the art and the science of aha moments? Which is when he went like, ha, 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 you can't have art and sciences in the same sentence. That's a dichotomy. So, ladies and gentlemen, today we're talking about the art and science of aha moments. And I'd like to share with you a piece of my research which has fundamentally changed my perception. It has changed the way that I create and the way that I work. It actually has changed the way that I live. And my story starts here. When I was growing up, my teachers used to tell me, never leave to tomorrow that which you can do today. Nula sapem wine chepot face as. Let me see your hand if you've heard this one before. Yeah, and you have to understand, I really took that to heart. You have a master's degree, which takes two years to complete, and there's me finishing it in nine months. You have a Dutch language and integration college, which takes five years to complete. There's me finishing it in two months. You have a driver's license theory, which takes a few weeks to learn, and there's me learning it in three hours the night before the exam and passing. I never really understood those people who said good things come to those that wait. I was more of the belief that good things come to those that work hard for them. 
and so hard work, perseverance and pushing through things has been the motto of my entire life and I think, I believe, I speak for most people here in this room today. Somewhere along the line we have gotten the idea that the harder that we work and the busier that we keep our children and our families, that the more effective and successful we will become. But instead of success, what this philosophy has brought me is not one, but two burnouts by the age of 35. And if you've read the internet lately, you will know that I'm not an exception to the rule. Burnout is actually a global epidemic. So I started thinking, well, what is it that takes a select number of people, they live the same amount of years as the rest of us and have seemingly the same quality of life as the rest of us, yet they go from one aha moment to another, they go from one breakthrough to another, they invent these countless extraordinary things, leaving the rest of us scratching our heads and asking ourselves, well, why didn't I come up with that? You know, like the first telephone or artificial intelligence, or these very nifty uh, shoes umbrellas. <laughs> and, you know, Aristotle said that excellence is a habit. So I thought, if I could find a pattern in the habits of these extraordinary people, then I would crack the code to aha. And so I started on a quest. I was going to crack the code of aha. I cherry-picked my subjects very carefully. You know, the Einsteins, the Wozniaks, and the Steve Jobs of the world. And I looked at their lives through the lens of such questions as, well, what did they eat? How many hours did they work? How long did they sleep? And so on. And whilst I found some common patterns, like, for example, Nietzsche, who liked to work standing up, and so did uh, Lewis Carroll, Virginia Woolf, Nabokov. I also found some very peculiar habits, like Stravinsky, who used to do headstands, or Pythagoras, who refused to eat beans, or Beethoven, who would throw ice water over his head. Yeah, different strokes for different folks. I found as many habits as there were people. And whilst I wasn't able to define a common golden set of habits, I did come to one realization. And that realization is that it wasn't what those people were doing before the breakthrough occurred, but what they were doing at the time when the breakthroughs were taking place that was the common pattern. Let me see your hand if you know what Isaac Newton was doing when he discovered gravity. He was sitting under a tree, wasn't he? Doing nothing. And what about Steve Jobs when he invented the world's greatest brand? Was he in some kind of a marketing meeting, brainstorming with the team? No, he was alone on a Sunday afternoon in a garden doing nothing. And how about Salvador Dali before he painted any of his masterpieces? Was he drafting, sketching like a maniac? No. He would sit down, close his eyes, and do nothing, deliberately. Ladies and gentlemen, the biggest discoveries are not the result of a set of habits or some kind of a precise science. They are the result of doing nothing. Now, if you're anything like me, you're not going to take this finding at face value. Uh, doing nothing where I come from is a big no-no. It's actually associated with a sin, sloth, lenevia. You go to hell if you do nothing. So, well, I wanted to find the findings, and I started a deep research. I'm going to find the statistics which are proving me that doing nothing has anything to do with innovation, with breakthroughs, and so on. Well, you will not be surprised. There's not much science out there which proves how doing nothing has anything to do with effectiveness or innovation. The only thing this research has brought me is a lot of sleepless nights and frustration. And it was during those sleepless nights that I started to practice mindfulness, meditation, running, and so on. I tried 
pretty much every trick in the book just to get my mind to stop from racing and these thoughts from going crazy and to get some sleep. But try as I may, nothing was working. Until one night, I decided, you know what, I'm not going to win this war anyway, so I might as well give up. And I gave up. This is when it happened. It was during that night that one thought stood out. Very simple thought. What was Isaac Newton doing under the tree? What if he, like me, had his eyes closed? And that's when it happened. That's when I had my aha moment. The research that I needed to find was not on how doing nothing is impacting innovation, but what, what happens in our brain when we close our eyes. And what do you know? Indeed, recent studies have found that when we close our eyes and let our mind wander, an interconnected group of pathways in our brain highlights and activates. It's called the default mode network. This is what this default mode network looks like, like a you know, colorful cotton candy. And the peculiarity of this network is that it only activates when you're quiet and you close your eyes, and it deactivates when you're focused on any activity. Until recently, science has thought that our brain is quiet during rest. Now we know that this could not be further from the truth. In fact, our brain is even more active when we are at rest than it is when we're focused on any activity. Here is our brain right now. This is your brain at this moment as you're focusing on this talk. And here's our brain at rest. Our brain is a lot more active when we close our eyes and let it do nothing. Now, the interesting thing is that it's during that state when the default mode network activates, that's when we put events in our life into a context. This is when we develop memory. And this is also when new connections are made. Pathways, so neural pathways, which were previously not related to one another, now find their way to each other and make love. The default mode network is like the dating service for our neurons. And th this is when the bread that you ate that morning um, gets coupled with a mechanical slicer that you read about in a paper, and sliced bread gets invented. This is when the trolley you used to do groceries gets coupled with a heavy suitcase and the wheelie the suitcase gets invented. This is when the shoes that you ordered online gets coupled with the memory of a heavy rain you once got caught in and this very nifty shoes umbrellas get invented. And ladies and gentlemen, the important part is that these connections, these breakthroughs, are as unique and as limitless as your experiences and memories are. Genius is not a chance occurrence. It's not something that is reserved for a select few. There is a genius in every single one of you. There are thousands of breakthroughs sitting just behind your closed eyelids. So let us go through the world, not limited by what we can see, not limited by what we can think up, but limitless by the infinite possibilities that we can conjure up as soon as we close our eyes and let our minds wander. Thank you.